We're in Brooklyn. We're right down the street. The Brooklyn Academy, Academy of Music has been the catalyst for the transformation of a neighborhood. In a couple of hours, I will be at PS 109 in East Harlem, where a former public school has, uh, in a neighborhood that no one wanted to ever go near, is being made into an art gallery and performance space. And what happened? The property values in the surrounding blocks tripled and the tax base increased. Chattanooga, Tennessee has been transformed by its arts district. In my hometown, St. Louis, City Garden, a public sculpture park, has provided a reason for people to linger downtown rather than just get in their cars after a Cardinals game and drive back to the suburbs. They don't have that problem now. There are no Cardinals games. <laughs> and, and Chicago, Illinois, where I just found out we're, we're, we're going to be next year, which is great. Don't even get me started about Chicago. Uh, Mayor Daley should be the number one hero to everyone in this country who cares about art because he was a visionary in this field before there was a field. His work, I should add, began in 1989, 13 years before New York City's great arts advocate, Mayor Bloomberg, was even elected. Daley spent public money to restore the old, old vaudeville houses in Chicago and created a bustling downtown theater district. He built Millennium Park with its dynamic arts installations and connected it to the Art Institute of Chicago. And now both are powerful attractions for Chicagoans and tourists. It sometimes, sometimes seems like he's created an arts festival for every neighborhood in the city. Now, Mayor Daley may love art, but he's a tough guy, and don't think he's not focused every day on the ledger of the city's economy. Create an art scene downtown, and small towns have downtowns too, and you change the place. Artists are great placemakers. They are entrepreneurs, and they should be the centerpiece of every town's strategy for the future. We, we, know, we know now that business follows labor, not the other way around. Strong footnotes here to Richard Florida. Companies seek a highly skilled workforce, and that workforce seeks places with a high quality of life. And at the top of the quality of life criteria are education and culture. Business follows people, and people follow other people. To twist a great line from Field of Dreams, sports metaphor again, um, if you come, they will build it. <laughs> Today, we are announcing that I will spend the next six months visiting neighborhoods and towns all across America, seeing and spotlighting all the ways that art works. I will visit downtown sculpture gardens, art walks along riverfronts, free public performances and exhibitions, historic building renovations, and subsidized artist workplaces and residences. And I'm going to kick off this Artworks tour with a visit to, where else? Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> on, on November 6th, Carol Coletta, uh, the president of CEOs for Cities, will join me in, ta in talking with political, civic, and arts leaders, including Kathy Chitwood, the head of the East Light Theater, who's invited me to see a performance of Rent, Thought maybe I'd never see that show again. <laughs> and, uh, and, in looking, uh, and in looking at Peoria's warehouse district, uh, that, might, that, that might just become the site of a new Mass Mocha or Marfa. Uh, I, already, I already have trips planned to Missouri and Tennessee, and we are setting up visits to California, Idaho, Kentucky, and Washington State. I know firsthand that great art can come from the unlikeliest of places. A few years ago, I visited, at Eric, I visited at Eric, Oklahoma, where a museum was being dedicated to one of my idols, the great country music songwriter and singer Roger Miller. He wrote the music for my first show, Big River. While driving the 140 miles or so from Oklahoma City to Eric, you pass the hometowns of Sheb Woolley, one of the founders and creators of rock and roll, the songwriter Jimmy Webb, and Garth Brooks, and of course, Roger Miller. What's in the water there? There's certainly no music conservatories, probably precious few music teachers. No colleges, no art centers, nothing. Just an, just an inexplicable concentration of genius. I'm very excited about my upcoming trip. But we also need to hear from you. Many of you have been working hard, uh, doing for years what we at the NEA are just starting to talk about now. And I hope you will tell us about it. We are opening up a page on the NEA's website where each of you and any of your colleagues can post examples and stories of how art works in your communities. I will also be posting dispatches from the stops of my tour. We need to compare, to compare notes, we need to get together and find where the best ideas are. In fact, we are planning a gathering in the spring on art and neighborhood revitalization 
and we hope to have your active participation in that. But we need to do more than talk. We need to begin lasting partnerships in this, in this arena. And there's nothing that will give Congress more confidence when appropriations time comes than showing how we, the public and private sectors, are working toward a common purpose. And we need to start yesterday. Between the time of my nomination and confirmation, I reached out to a number of important foundation leaders, and my conversations with them were more than encouraging. If there's one thing I'm sure of, it's that, that, it's that there are great projects, some of, them, some of them already teed up, that we can work on together and achieve some inspiring early successes. To borrow a line from the artist-in-chief, I'm fired up and ready to go. Am I starting to sound like an advocate? Well, that seems to be a touchy subject. Uh, some, some quote unquote journalists have, have recently accused this agency uh, of losing its independence and becoming a propaganda machine. While I want to state in no uncertain terms that the NEA is not a political agency and, then when, and that when art becomes propaganda, I lose all interest in it. I also want everyone to know that the days of a defensive NEA are over. We, we have a plan, and we're going to, quote, advocate for it. Remember, please, that the NEA is an unusual agency within the federal government. We've always been considered the champion of the arts and artists in the public sector. In a sense, we do advocate for them in a way that the IRS doesn't advocate for taxes or the FCC for bandwidth. We promote the arts. We are grant makers not a regulatory or, or an enforcement agency. And we will advocate for the president's agenda uh, as well. Uh, if it's a particular program, you know, e.g. health care reform, no, of course not. But the president picked me for a reason, and I decided to go to Washington and sign on with a federal bureaucracy uh, for a reason. <laughs> and that reason and that reason is that, is that within the ethos of this White House, where words like change and hope and aspiration have real meaning, the arts can play a starring role. Whatever might be said on television, radio, or blog sites, I have no intention of walking away from the compelling themes of this presidency and a historic opportunity in arts policy. Will we realize our hopes? Hey, I'm an optimist. I produce the producers, so I'm sure Mel Brooks would give me permission to appropriate and butcher some lines from that show. We are, we are optimistic, irrational, unrealistic, and delusional. But we can't help it. We're grant makers in the arts. Thank you.